When I was at Expona this past weekend, I had a lot of people saying, Aaron, did you hear the new Dayton Opal One speakers? Little bookshelf speakers, five inch or so mid bass drivers and a one inch dome tweeter. And I was like, no, I didn't. But I kind of lied because I've had these in for about two weeks. So I already listened to them and I had already measured them. Now, I told a few of my patrons, you know, yes, I've actually heard them. And here's kind of my subjective thoughts on it right now. But for the most part, I just kind of dodged that bullet for the time being. The Opal Ones were sent to me directly by Dayton. I don't think they're going to they're going to let me keep them, but they might. And if they do, I'll make sure to post a community note and let you all know. Retail price is about eight hundred dollars per pair. And when I got these in, I got to say that they're a very nice looking speaker. They feature a midwoofer that has a huge surround and then two passive radiators on the back. All right, so let's start off with the sound. I set these speakers up in my room next to the Kef Blade 2 Metas initially. And the reason I did that is because the Blade 2 Metas are objectively a very neutral speaker and they sound very neutral to my ears. Setting them up against the blades, while not quite fair and certainly not ideal because there is some extension of the baffle in both cases, it still allows me to kind of get an idea of the, the timbre of the speakers. Switching back and forth between the two allows me to immediately notice any sort of differences in that timbre, and it allows me to better relay to you what I hear and hopefully be able to relate it more accurately to the measurements. So in my listening tests, I was about to three feet out from the wall initially. Now I did do further testing, but I'm talking about my initial testing. With the Opal Ones set up directly on axis, to me, the top end was just a little bit, maybe a little bit too bright. Towing them off axis by about maybe 10 degrees, but not any further than that, seemed to take down the top end a little bit. Now, I don't necessarily know that you're gonna need to do that. In fact, you may actually prefer them being pointed directly at you in the listening position. The biggest difference that I noticed between the Opal One and the Kef Blade 2 is in the mid-range, from, from like the lower mid-range to the lower upper mid-range. So roughly 200 hertz to 2 kilohertz. Now, when I looked at my data, I saw why. But in my listening sessions, that lower mid-range with the Kef is much more full and pronounced. With the Opal Ones, they actually oddly sound a little bit more focused, but there's less things around them. And then on the upper end of things, sometimes the sound characteristic was just too forward for me. So after doing that ABX testing, I moved the Kefs out of the way, put them to the side of the room, and then just focused on listening to the Opal Ones. And I pushed them a little bit closer to the walls because the manufacturer or designer in this case actually said that he designed them to be listened to from about one feet to about two feet off the wall behind it, referenced from the back of the speaker. So I wanted to do what they recommended. And in doing so, I still kind of noticed that same sound characteristic, but it wasn't as readily apparent as it was when I was able to ABX switch test between those and the KEFs. Now, I went and looked at the data after I did all my listening, and I saw that there's a scoop in the mid-range and a boost around one kilohertz. So I thought, all right, well, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to flatten that out to get a more linear on-axis response, and then I'm going to do some switching back and forth between equalization with it more linearized versus no equalization. And without getting too deep into the rabbit hole of subjective isms, what I found very interesting is that without EQ and with that scoop in the mid range, I lack the fullness, yes, but the very interesting thing to me was that without that fullness, there was a more locked in centered center image, right? So if you have something playing and you got a vocalist and they're panned right between the left and right loudspeaker, then they're gonna be in the center of the stage, the sound stage. So when I'm listening to the Opal Ones, I notice that, yeah, they're right between the sound stage, but there's nothing else going on. Then when I add the equalization to make it more linear through that mid range, that 200 to about, let's say 800 Hertz region, I bring back in the fullness, which is a sound that I prefer, but in doing so, it also seemed to make the mid-range a bit more diffuse. And I think that makes sense just from the perspective of 
you're catching more of the details, more of the nuances and things in the soundstage, more of the vocalist. But what it, what was weird to me was that it sounded like the vocalist spread out more and they filled the space between the loudspeakers more with that area smoothed out, flattened out, if you will, as opposed to leaving that scoop in the mid-range there. Now, again, I prefer that to not have a scoop. That's just my preference. But it is an interesting observation, and I'm curious to know, those of you who heard these speakers at Expona, did you feel like the center vocalist was just really locked in place? Let me know. Now, for the top end, or the mid-top end around 1K, I also brought that down. And I, I did all this with the Weem amp. When I did that, it seemed like I was able to make the mid-range lock more in a centered position in terms of depth, right? So there is soundstage depth, like how deep the soundstage, if, if this is the front of the soundstage and this is the back, there's the depth of the soundstage. And then there's the depth within the soundstage or where the vocalist is placed. And it's a total psychoacoustic thing. But a trick that you can do if you want to make vocal sound more forward is you can bump up around 1K, bring that up, and that'll actually sound like it brings out the vocalist a little bit more forward out of the mix. Another thing that you can do if you want to make it sound a little bit more recessed is you can cut around 2.5K or 5K. And it doesn't take a lot, maybe like a decibel or two, and you can kind of recess the vocalist in the mix. So with that in mind, the vocalist sounded forward because of that 1K area bump, but at the same time, they sounded a lot more focused without a lot of ambiance around them because of that cut in the mid-range. And I thought that was really, again, interesting. I hate to keep using that word, but yeah, it was just a really interesting psychoacoustic effect of the nonlinear behavior of the speaker. As I said, I was using the Weem amp and these speakers with their low sensitivity around 78 decibels on average needed more power. So then what I did was I used my March audio, I think it's the P501 mono block amplifiers. I hooked those up to a separate AVR, ran those out of the AVR, and then I was able to get adequate output levels to really test the bass. Like how strong is the bass? Because with just the Weem amp at 10 feet away, that William amp was not enough to drive these speakers to adequate output levels. I mean, if I was hitting in the mid 70 decibel region, I was doing good. Usually I'm listening to 80 to 85 decibels. And when I'm trying to pick out certain characteristics relating to the bass, I want it to be a little bit higher in level. So I'll turn it up a little bit more. So with the P501s, I was able to crank the volume up, get a lot more output out of these speakers, and then focus more on what's the extension like. The extension to me, because there's a bit of a bass bump around 100 hertz or so, and we'll see it in the data, isn't necessarily extended low as much as it's emphasized as like a mid-bass punch. Now, they do get pretty low, reasonably uh, speaking, but that extra little hump right around 100 hertz relative to that mid-range scoop makes them sound a little bit more punchy. So in my opinion, just subjectively speaking, the overall tonal characteristic of the speaker is that with the mid-range scoop, it sounds more focused. With that mid-range bump around 1K, it sounds a little bit more forward. And with that mid-bass bump, it sounds a little bit more punchy. As for the top end, it does start to roll off pretty quickly. So as I said, if you do set these up, you may find that aiming them directly on axis, pointed at your ears, is the best situation. If I towed them off more than 10 degrees, it felt like the top end, like the cymbals and the hi-hats and things like that, just lost the air and the percussiveness of those particular instruments. And so I would recommend don't turn them off axis any more than about 10 degrees. For those of you who normally don't have stereo setups, I know that a lot of newcomers will set the speakers up so where they're pointed directly out into the room and they're basically kind of parallel with the wall behind them. Most speakers, however, are not designed to be listened to that way. Most speakers are designed to be pointed pretty much dead at you or maybe slightly off. If you tow most speakers off axis too much where they're facing directly out into the room, again, parallel with the wall behind it, you'll lose top end. Some speakers fall off more rapidly than others. I feel like above like 10K or so, these fell off pretty quickly. So again, I wouldn't tow them out more than about 10 degrees. I would make sure that they're probably pointed directly at you or slightly skewed just a little bit, depending on 
your room, and your tastes. Now let's start talking about the data. The data that you're about to see is captured using a state-of-the-art Clipple near-field scanner. This allows me to get anechoic data in a non-anechoic room, such as my garage, which you see in this video. Now this data allows us to understand exactly what the speaker is doing without having to worry, is it the speaker or the room? And then that way you have a better idea of how this speaker is gonna match up with your preference, with your room, and how best to implement it. Should you put it close to the wall? Should you bring it out from a wall? Should you turn it one way or another? Where do you need to sit in reference to the, the tweeter or the midwoofer? All of these things can be answered pretty readily with the data and take a lot of guesswork out, allows you to make direct comparisons with other speakers that I've measured and really just helps you to cut down on that shopping list a lot more efficient, efficiently, efficiently. The average sensitivity according to my measurements is about 75.7 decibels. Now, Dayton represents this as a 78 decibel sensitivity speaker, but the way that I capture sensitivity is I take a mean from about 300 Hertz to three kilohertz. And because there is this pretty significant dip here of almost three decibels right through the mid range, that brings the average SPL or sensitivity down. This speaker is pretty much within about plus or minus three decibels, except for there is a bit of a dip on axis at around maybe like three and a half K. That's because of diffraction. You can see the F3 is at 55 Hertz and my calculated F10 is at 30 Hertz. Now these are again, reference to the mean SPL. This is the CEA 2034 data set that allows us to get a good idea of what the sound power of the speaker is, how it's radiating sound all around it, not just directly on axis, but to the front, to the back. We could take this data and get a pretty good quick idea of not just how linear is the speaker, but how EQable is it as well. And in a case like this, we can see that, yeah, it's not very linear. As I said, it's within about plus or minus three decibels for the most part but that's about a six decibel window overall. But the, the key factor here is that in this mid-range area, according to the ERDI data, there are no significant resonances here that should be an issue. And you can equalize this to be more smooth like I did in my listening test. You can also equalize this about 800 Hertz to about two kilohertz region down if you find it to be too forward as I did in my listening tests. The only area where you really can't get away with equalization is around three to four to five kilohertz in this ballpark right here. And that's because of diffraction. And if you're not aware, basically diffraction is where the sound emanates directly out of the speaker facing toward you, but it also hits the side edge of that speaker. And then it comes out and it comes out to you out of phase. So you have two different sound sources. You've got one directly from the tweeter and you've got the other one from the edge of that cabinet coming to you. The delay in time is gonna be equal to the frequency where that dip into fraction is gonna be. Can you hear that? In my experience, it varies. In a speaker like this, I would say that, yeah, it's probably gonna be more audible than other speakers. Sometimes that diffraction dip might be much more narrow and maybe more deep. In those cases, it's less audible, but this one kind of covers from about maybe 2K to about 5K or so. So it's about an octave wide. I think you're gonna be able to hear that more than you might with other diffraction dips. And the other issue is that you're not really going to be able to equalize that particular area because if you equalize this up, then that means you're making the direct sound higher in amplitude, but you're also making the reflected sound higher in amplitude. And as you'll see in the horizontal contour plot, this three kilohertz area is already higher in amplitude. So by increasing it in the direct sound field, you're also increasing the reflected sound and it's going to stand out more to you, might be more sharp or uh, maybe a little bit too much attack in that particular area. And while I'm here, I'll also go ahead and note the horizontal radiation is about plus or minus 60 degrees, which is where I personally like the horizontal radiation to be. And that window is kind of the sweet spot for me personally. So that's why I like the soundstage width. But again, this two to about four kilohertz area is more broad overall. Now let's look at the estimated in-room response, which is a really good idea of what the overall timbre of the speaker is gonna be like in-room. So what I'm providing you here is with the speaker aimed directly at you, and in red, the speaker aimed about 30 degrees off axis, which is pretty much this graphic. In black, aimed at you. In red, aimed away from you. And now what I've done is draw a line that's indicative of how I heard these speakers in my listening room. And really the, the key takeaway here, two things, right? The mid-range dip that I spoke about earlier, there's a little bit of forwardness in this 
one to two kilohertz region, it may not be an issue to you. It, it didn't really bother me too much, but it is there. The higher frequency is the other thing that I wanted to point out because when you get above about, I'd say 14K or so, it starts to drop off pretty rapidly. And I think that you're gonna pick up on that in uh, higher frequency areas like air, sparkle, shimmer, hi-hats and cymbals, those kind of instruments and if you turn these speakers away from you in this red, you'll see that this starts falling off closer to about uh, maybe about seven, eight kilohertz. So it starts to roll off a little bit sooner there. That's why I said earlier, I would recommend you point these speakers more toward you than away from you. On the low end, you do have an extended bass shelf, which allows for close to wall placement. Other speakers might you know, kind of roll off through this and have like a little bit of a, a hump through this area as opposed to this little bit of a shelf right here. And so that allows you to put the speakers a little bit closer to the wall without sounding too boomy. Of course, you will have to play with placement in your own room, but other speaker manufacturers use this kind of design. The one that stands out to me, at least more readily right now, is Kef's R3 Meta. The vertical window is about plus or minus 20 degrees, so you need to make sure that you're in line with that tweeter's center position. Harmonic distortion to 86 decibels, and then at 96 decibels, I'm actually, I think this is pretty good for a speaker that has just a five and a quarter inch mid-woofer driver. Multi-tone distortion full band indicates that once you go from about 87 decibels at one meter to about 96 decibels at one meter, in this gray versus this green, you can see there's a pretty big jump. So this indicates to me that somewhere in that ballpark, which it's about nine decibel swing, Somewhere in that region, you're going to start really ramping up that multi-tone or intermodulated distortion. Now, at my listening levels, with my amplifiers, even though I was able to get kind of loud with those two mono blocks with the Weem, I was never able to achieve this kind of output level. So I didn't have to worry about multi-tone distortion. It's going to be a balance of the sensitivity of the speaker, the power you have available, and then what this multi-tone distortion is showing you. If you use a subwoofer and cross these over about like 80 hertz or so, what you do is you decrease this mid-range distortion, but you still have higher high frequency distortion. What about compression? Well, these actually look pretty good in terms of compression for the size that they are. The only issue that I ran into is that this highest output volume of 102 decibels at one meter, that's when you really start to lose that mid-range, lower mid-bass output capability. So the dynamic range of the speaker, I would say is about 20 decibels of good dynamic range, but going above about 96 decibels, that's when you start to really run into more compression and that starts to impact the dynamic range of your listening session. As I said earlier, if you heard these at Expona, please let me know your thoughts. I really am curious what you thought of them and also give as many specifics as you can, like where you sat in the room and what music you were listening to. Uh, the biggest thing about going to those kind of shows is that most of the time you're not able to sit in the prime seated position. So you're sitting off to the side and it's really hard to judge a speaker with that in mind. I, I don't want to go into the rabbit hole of discussing why that's a problem. Maybe I'll do that in another video one day, but that's why I'm asking you to give as many specifics as you can about what you heard and where you were in the listening room, because I would be curious to see how that might correlate with my data here. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up. And if you're new to this channel and you enjoy this kind of content, please hit the subscribe button. If you want to support me and what I do, you can join me at patreon.com slash Aaron's Audio Corner. Otherwise, you can use any of my generic affiliate links for Amazon, Crutchfield. I don't have one for Parse Express right now, but I'm working on getting one because some of you may be interested in buying these speakers. And if you are, if you want to purchase it through that, that would certainly be appreciated. It doesn't change the data and it hasn't changed my review at all. I've already told you my honest opinion, but still, if you're interested, that would help me out. I appreciate you watching. I will talk to y'all later. Take care. Peace.